In the last several videos, we've discussed code generation for a very simple programming language. In this video, we're going to take a look at code generation for a more advanced feature, objects. Fortunately, the standard code generation strategy for objects is really just an extension of what we've already learned. So everything that you learned before, we're going to be using, and then there's going to be some additional things that we do uh, specifically for objects. And the important thing to know about objects, the slogan that you hear uh, when people talk about object-oriented programming is this one. So if, if B is a subclass of A, then an object of class B can be used wherever an object of class A is expected. So there's a substitutability property. If I have a piece of code that can work on A's, then it can also work on B's and any other subclass of A. Now what this means for the, uh, for the case of code generation is that the code that we generate for class A, so the code that we produce for methods in class A, has to work unmodified for an object of class B. And to see this, keep in mind that when we compile, a, uh, when we compile class A, uh, we may not even know all the subclasses of A. So those may not even have been defined yet. So in the future, some programmer may come along, define a subclass of A, and my, our, uh, our compiled version of A uh, will have to work with that new subclass. So there are really only two questions that we have to answer to give a complete description of how to generate code for objects. Uh, the first one is how are objects represented in memory? So we need to decide on a layout and representation for objects. And the second one is how is dynamic dispatch implemented? So that's the characteristic feature of using objects is that we can dispatch to a method in the object and we need an implementation of that. So uh, to be concrete, we're going to use this little example throughout uh, this video. And I'll just take a moment here to, to point out some features of it. So we have three classes, uh, classes A, B, and C. Uh, notice that A is a base class and B and C uh, both inherit from A. And uh, all three classes uh, define uh, some attributes, some fields, and also some methods. Now a couple of important features here is that notice that uh, because B inherits from A and C inherits from A, they, all, they both inherit, both of those classes inherit the attributes A and D from class A. So these two attributes that are defined in class A are available in class B and in class C. So even though there's no mention of A and D uh, in the definition, say, of class B, uh, the methods in class B can still refer to uh, those attributes. They are part of the attributes of class B. They're just in copied over or inherited from A. Another feature of this example that I'd like to point out is that all of the methods refer to the attribute A. So attribute A is referred to in this method, in this one, referred to twice in this method, and also uh, in this method. And the significance of this is just what we discussed a couple of slides ago. Uh, for all of these methods to work, attribute A is going to have to live in some uh, place, in some place where all of them uh, can find it when their generated code runs. So in particular, let's consider the method F. So the method F um, exists in all three classes. Uh, all three uh, classes, uh, you know, when it runs, it will refer to uh, the attribute A. And even though the objects would be different, in one case it might be running on an A object, in another case on a C object, uh, it will need to be able to find the attribute A. And so therefore, the attribute A has to be in the same place uh, in each object. And so how do we accomplish that? Well, the first principle is that objects are laid out in contiguous memory. So an object is just a block of memory, okay, with no gaps, and all the data for the object is stored in the words of that block of memory. And each attribute is stored at a fixed offset in the object. So for example, there may be a place in this object for attribute A. And in this case, it's at uh, you know, in the middle of the object, is in the, in the fourth position. And no matter what kind of object it is, whether it's an A, B, or C object, in our example, 
attribute A will always live at that position so that any piece of code that refers to A, any method that refers to A can find, can find uh, the A attribute. Now the other thing that's important uh, to understand, and this is a uh, you know, slight digression from what we're talking about, but it's, uh, it's a key aspect of uh, code generation for objects, is that when a method is invoked, uh, the object itself is the self parameter. So the self parameter is this entire object. So self, when a, when a function is invoked, will refer to the entire object. So you think of self as being a pointer to the entire object. Uh, remember that self is like the this uh, variable or this name in Java. And then the fields uh, will refer to particular, or the attributes of the object will refer to particular positions within the object. So for example, the A attribute we decided lived there. So here is the particular object layout used in cool. So the first three words of a cool object contain header information. And every cool object always has these three entries. Uh, the first position is a class tag at offset zero. The next word at offset four is the size of the object, and then something called the dispatch pointer, and then all of the attributes. Now the class tag is an integer uh, which just identifies the class of the object. So the compiler will number all of the classes. So in our example we had three classes, A, B, and C, and the compiler, for example, might assign them the numbers one, two, and three. And it doesn't matter what these numbers are as long as they are different from each other. So it doesn't have to be numbered consecutively or anything like that. The important thing is that the class tag is a unique identifier uh, for a class. Each class has its own unique bit pattern that tells you what kind of class the object is. And the other uh, fields here, the object size is also an integer, which is just the size of the object in words. And the dispatch pointer is a pointer to a table of methods. So the, the methods are stored off to the side and the dispatch pointer uh, is a pointer to that table. And we'll talk about this more later. And then all the attributes are laid out in the subsequent slots uh, in some order that's determined by the compiler. So the compiler will fix an order for the attributes in the class and then all the objects of that class will have the attributes of that class in the same order. And again, uh, all of this is laid out in a continuous chunk of memory. Now we're ready to talk about how inheritance works. So the basic idea is that given a layout for a class A, a layout for a subclass B, so this is a subclass of A, uh, can be defined by extending the layout of A. So we don't need to move any of the attributes of A, uh, we can just add more fields onto the end of A's layout. And so that's going to leave the layout of A unchanged, which is a great property because this is how uh, the position of a, an attribute in the A object will always be the same for all the subclasses. So essentially, uh, we will never, once we decide where an attribute lives in a class, it will never change uh, for any of the subclasses of that object. So B is just going to be an extension of the layout of A. So let's take a look at an, our example here and uh, see how that, that works. Uh, let me just write down here a little bit about these classes because we don't have the example on the screen. So we had class A and class A had two attributes, A and D. Okay, and it, it doesn't matter what their types are or what the methods were. Here we're just looking at the class names and the names of the attributes that are defined in the class. And then we had B, which uh, inherits from A and B added an attribute little b, and then we had C, which also inherits from A, but has no relationship to B. And uh, class C defined an attribute little c. All right, so that's the, the structure of our example that's relevant uh, to the layout of the objects. Okay, so let's talk about the layout of class A. So in position zero, at offset zero, there'll be a tag for A. That'll be some small integer that the compiler picks. Uh, there'll be the size of A. We'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, there'll be the dispatch pointer, okay, which we're going to talk about later. And then come the attributes of A. And they're just laid out. The, you know, the way it's done in uh, the, the cool C implementation is that they are laid out in the order 
in which they appear uh, textually in the class. So in this case, first the attribute A, and then the attribute D at offsets 12 and 16. And now, since the uh, object, there were two attributes and three header words, that means that the size of the object is five words, and so it's a five that goes in, uh, in the size field for A objects. Now let's take a look at B. Okay, so B uh, is going to have a different tag. B objects will have a different tag, so they, uh, to distinguish them from A objects. Um, there's going to be an extra field, so the size will be one bigger. But now the layout preserves the layout of A, so the uh, attributes of A appear in the same positions. And you can think of there being an A object actually embedded inside of the B object. If I were to strip off the, uh, the end here, if I were to just, you know, cover up this last bit here of B, I would see that this uh, object here has the same size and the same attributes as an A object. And so any piece of code that uh, could work on an A object will also make sense running on a B object. Now, of course, the tag is different because it actually is a subclass and, you know, and there is this extra field so the size is different, but the point is that any code that refers just to the fields here uh, will still work just fine. Uh, so any A method that was compiled to refer to the methods of an A object uh, will still find those attributes in the same place in the B object. Now, of course, there's also one more field here, uh, which is the new attribute of B, and that just gets laid out after all of A's fields. So after all of A's fields come all of B's fields in the same order in which they appear uh, textually in the class, and since there's only one, there's just one new field there. And now, looking at class C, well, the story with class C is, is very similar. So C has its own distinct tag. It also has one more attribute than A, so it has size 6. And now, uh, again, the A attributes are in the same positions. And now the C uh, attribute just comes after the A attribute. And so notice here that A methods, again, will work just fine on C objects because the attributes are in the same places. And so uh, the methods will find the attributes where they expect to. Uh, you cannot, however, call a method of class B on an object of class C, okay, because they have different uh, attributes in the third position. These may have completely different types. It may not make sense to invoke a B method on a C object, but that's just fine, because if we look at our inheritance hierarchy over here, we see that B and C are actually unrelated. They're, they are both subclasses of A, but they have no relationship to each other. B is not a subclass of C, and C is not a subclass of B. And so anything beyond their shared um, ancestry with A can be completely different in the layout. So more generally, if we have a chain of inheritance relationships, let's say we have a base class A1, and A2 inherits from A1, and A3 inherits from A2, and so on, uh, with some uh, class AN uh, inheriting um, at the bottom of this, uh, of this chain after some long sequence of, uh, of other intermediate subclasses, you know, what is the layout of, of all these classes going to look like? Well, uh, there's going to be a header, okay, the three-word header, and that will be followed by A1's attributes, and then followed by A2's attributes, followed by A3's attributes, and so on, all the way down to AN's attributes down here, okay? And if you look, again, something we talked about before, each prefix of this header is essentially a valid object, uh, a valid one of these objects. So if I look at the first set of attributes, everything up to the end of the A1 attributes, that forms a valid layout for an A1 object. If I stop at the A2 attributes, I have a, I have a valid layout for an A2 object going all the way from the header down to uh, you know, including the A1 and A2 objects. And then A3 uh, includes all of A1, A2, and A3's attributes, and so on, okay? And so each um, prefix of, uh, of this object, of this A N object, uh, has the, the correct layout for some, uh, for some superclass of A N. Now that we've dealt with the layout of an object's attributes, we can switch gears and talk about how we lay out its methods and how we implement dynamic dispatch. So let's consider uh, a dispatch call e.g uh, where uh, e here let's say is of class b. Okay, And so what do we want to have happen? Well, uh, we want to invoke uh, the g method here in class b. Okay, So that seems pretty straightforward. 
So now let's consider a slightly more complicated example. What if we are invoking uh, e dot f? What if we're calling the f method? Well, if we have a b object, uh, then uh, we are going to uh, want to invoke this method, this f method, okay, which is the f method defined in b. Uh, but if we have an a object, we want to be sure that we invoke this method, okay, this version of f. All right, and so this f down here is said to be overridden. Okay, so we have redefined uh, method f in class B, and this definition replaces the method uh, definition that B would otherwise have inherited from A. So in particular in class C, class C also has an F method, okay, and if we invoke the F method, uh, if it turns out that E here is of type C, then which method uh, should get invoked? Well, it would be this one. It would be the one defined in class A. So all three of these classes have an F method. Uh, if, if, the, uh, if we do a dynamic dispatch on either a C or an A object, we'll execute the one defined in class A. If we uh, do the dispatch on a B object, we will execute the method defined in class B. Now every class has a fixed set of methods, including the inherited methods. So if you, if you look, uh, if I tell you the name of a class, then you know exactly which methods it has. Uh, those methods never change at runtime. Okay, so uh, don't be confused here because overriding is something that's done at compile time. It's basically a static property. So the compiler can figure out, even though you can redefine methods in subclasses, uh, the compiler can figure out at compile time all the methods of a particular class. Methods are never changed while the program is executing. All right, and so a dispatch table or just a table of some sort is used to index these methods. And this is just an array of method entry points. So essentially for every method of the class, uh, there's an entry in the array for that method. And just like with attributes, a method f is going to live at a fixed offset in the dispatch table for a class and all of its subclasses. So once we determine the position that a method lives in, uh, it's in, it lives in its dispatch table, it will stay there uh, for any subclasses of that class. So let's take a look at our example again, and uh, just remind you of the structure of the example. We had class A, and now we only really care about the method. So uh, class A defined an F method, and then we had class B, which inherits from A, and that defined a G method. And then there was the class C, which also inherits from A, which defined an H method. All right, so uh, those three classes and these three methods, okay? And so the dispatch table uh, for class A uh, only has one method in it, so at offset zero, we store a pointer to the code for uh, the F method defined in A. Okay, so this is actually literally just a pointer to the first instruction of the code that will run method A. So this is a pointer to the uh, caller side of the calling sequence or to the label, uh, labeled instruction. That's the entry point uh, for the method. Now, what about, um, let's take a look next actually at class C. Okay, so class C uh, inherits from A, so it's going to have all the methods of A and they're going to be at the same offsets. So in particular, the F method will appear at offset zero in class C, and this points to the same method as the one in A, okay, since it inherits the, that method from A. And then class C defines its own method H, and so in the next position of the table um, goes uh, the pointer to the code for, for H. And you know, if there had been more methods uh, defined in these classes, then they would have appeared um, uh, you know, you know, laid out in textual order, just like for the attributes. So if there had been, say, two methods defined in A, then there would be two entries here uh, for the first method and the second method defined in A. And then if C defined, say, three methods, then there would be three more entries in the table and so on, okay? Now, uh, the interesting case is what happens in class B. 
So in class B, the F method is redefined, and I forgot to indicate that, so let me just indicate that up here. So the F method, we have a new definition of the F method in class B. Okay, so the important thing to see here is that the pointer uh, to the code for the F method lives in the same position. It's still the first entry in the table. Okay, so the position of the F method in the dispatch table for class B is exactly the same. That never changes. What's different is just the contents of that location. Uh, the first entry in the table here points to a different function. It points to the method that was uh, defined in B instead of the one that was defined in A. And then since uh, B defines uh, some additional methods or one additional method, uh, that gets laid out after uh, the methods uh, for A. Okay, you may recall a while ago that we talked about the object header and we mentioned this thing called the dispatch pointer. So let's just remind ourselves what goes in the object header. There's a tag, and then there's a size, and then there was a dispatch pointer. So, And then following the dispatch pointer were all the, all the attributes of the class. And now this dispatch pointer is just a pointer to the table of methods for that class. Okay, so this would be a pointer to the table um, that contains all the entries uh, for the methods, all the entry points of the methods uh, for that class. And the reason for using uh, this level of indirection, okay, so why do we have this pointer to a separate table, okay, why are the methods laid out like that when all the attributes are just embedded directly in the class? And we could, if we wanted to, just embed all the functions directly inside the object and, and you know, just put this whole table inside the object and, and not have this uh, extra pointer that we have to, we have to maintain and follow. And, and the reason for this is that the attributes uh, can be updated, okay? So the attributes for a, an object uh, can be unique to that object. Every object can have its own set of attributes, all right? But the functions, the methods for an object never change. And so the same object table can be shared between all the objects of a given class. So if I have uh, 100 A objects, well then I might have 100 different versions of the attributes, and so each uh, ob A object has to have its own copy of the attributes, but all those 100 A objects will have the same methods, and I can save a lot of space uh, by having them share a common table of the methods. All right, and again, every method of the class, or of, any, of every class, is assigned an offset, uh, and we'll call that O sub F, uh, in the dispatch table at compile time. So it's the job of the compiler to figure out all the methods in the class and then assign each of those methods a fixed position, a fixed offset in that dispatch table. So to wrap up, how do we implement dynamic dispatch? So let's say we have a dispatch to an expression E and we're calling the F method. So uh, here's the, uh, a, a slightly simplified version of the sequence of steps. So first we evaluate the expression E, and that's going to give us back an object X. Okay, and then we're going to get the dispatch table for X. Where does that come from? Well, it's in the header of X, so we can just take the object X itself, and we know that in every object, at the, in the third word, uh, there is a dispatch pointer uh, for the, uh, that, that's appropriate to the class of X. So we take that table and then we look up the entry point of F at the offset uh, for F in that dispatch table. Okay, and then we jump to that, uh, to that address. Okay, that's the entry point of the function. And, and when we do that, we bind self uh, to X. So the, the self parameter inside of the F method will be the X object.